Thanks uh, for coming, everybody. Uh, a little bit about myself. I wanted to, this is not necessarily to big mo note myself, but I wanted to just share with you a little bit about my journey because uh, if you'd asked me in 2008, or even going back further, 2005, would you end up being the chief executive of a $2.2 billion health service? I would have said, you are absolutely insane. There is no way that's ever gonna be my destiny. And yet somehow it's, it's happened um, and I'm actually quite enjoying myself. Um, and, I, and each of the steps I've made along the way, I haven't, I haven't regretted taking the opportunity, although at the time, almost every one of those represented a truly uh, frightening and, and uh, very intimidating challenge. Um, and so you know, my skill set has very much changed. So I'm an emergency physician and an academic clinical toxicologist. <coughs> and I've worked in five different countries. Um, I trained in toxicology in the United States. My, my kids were born there. Um, came back to Royal Perth in the early 2000s. Um, that's where I did most of my emergency medicine training. And I thought I would settle down to a life of being an emergency physician and doing toxicology. And a good friend and I established some toxicology services and got involved with that. And in 2000, end of 2005, I was the, sort of the last person standing when it was you know, people's turn to be uh, head of emergency medicine. So I sort of reluctantly put my hand up to do that job. In those days, being head of department in my hospital, um, really your measure of success was how good are you at protecting your turf and getting more resources. That, that, was, that was it. Um, very siloed approach. Um, and so my job was to get more consultants, um, do less work, um, and whine about things. That was, that was my job. Um, and I was pretty good at it. Um, at that time, access block in Western Australia was diabolical. Um, I remember when I, was in the, when I left to go to the United States in the late 1990s, there was no such thing as access block. Um, the emergency department was always half empty. We didn't have any problems managing patients who needed to go to the wards. Everything just seemed to be tickety-boo. And I remember catching up with some friends at a conference over, uh, overseas who I hadn't seen for a couple of years, and they said, oh, you know, we've had this really funny thing happen where the department's now half full of people who can't get beds. People are staying too long. And I'd read in the paper somewhere as far away as, as Denver, Colorado, that in Sydney you had this thing called ramping because it just started to emerge at about this time. Well, we, we, we love doing things bigger and better in Western Australia, so we became the worst place in Australia for, for access block and ramping pretty fast. Um, and by 2006, um, we were in a real crisis point. Um, and a whole bunch of bad things happen um, in hospitals when, when, this, when this goes on. Um, we were developing a situation where at any given moment there were 15 or 20 patients in our corridors lined up waiting for beds. Um, nobody outside the emergency department seemed to care. Um, the rest of the hospital seemed like a pretty nice, calm place. Um, but in the emergency department, we felt like we were in a war zone the whole time. And, and things started to sort of break down a little bit. We, we ended up developing a bit of a culture of blame. Uh, we were developing tribalism. Um, uh, there was, uh, people were unhappy. We, we were having no problems in the early 2000s getting trainees to come and train in emergency medicine. It seemed like a growth industry. And suddenly in these years, numbers started to plateau off. And all of our best and brightest emergency medicine trainees said, right, that's great. I'm gonna go and do intensive care or other things. Um, and it really seemed to be bad. Um, back in those days, go back a couple of slides, we were seeing on average just under 170 presentations a day and uh, we were getting 40% of them out within four hours, um, one way or the other. We had a 42% uh, admission rate, exactly the same admission rate as we have today, uh, nearly, nearly uh, eight or eight years later. Uh, six years later. Um, in those days, we could get 50% of our discharged patients home in four hours. Um, and we could get just one in four admitted patients in, into a bed within four hours. And 50% of our patients were waiting for admission 
more than eight hours for a bed after arrival in the ED. Um, and it was diabolical. We had um, ambulance diversion and we had ambulance ramping um, and it was bad publicity for the government. It was front page news. There was lots of blame going on. Um, hospital executives seemed relatively indifferent, um, but this was a big political thing. And I remember the minister at the time took a bit of an interest in this um, and so did the Director General of Health, uh, as we have in Western Australia, and um, got engaged directly with people like myself who are heads of department in, in emergency departments. I can't remember the exact date, but in the winter of 2000 and, um, 2007, I think it was, um, we had a particularly bad Tuesday. Tuesday was always our worst day when all of the major tertiary emergency departments around town were all trying to go on diversion. We were all ramping ambulances. We were all completely grid, grid, gridlocked. Um, and even our relationships, professional relationships with our fellow emergency medicine people were starting to break down. And I remember we were shouting at each other across the phone saying, oh, you open your ED, you're lazy, you haven't had as many patients as we, and you know, it's all, it all, you know, it was all just getting a bit unpleasant. And, and you know, some of our long-standing, really fantastic relationships with ambulance and you know, our nursing colleagues were all getting a little bit fraught and, and, and tethered it was, and, and tattered. So it was a bit unpleasant. On that particular day, um, it just so happened that the, the three biggest emergency departments had their heads of department on duty with the phones, if you like, on that day. And we were all sort of ringing each other up going, well, what can we do, what can we do? And at the end of the day, we said, look, let's, let's get together and have a coffee and just have a chat. I think it actually ended up, ended up being a bit stronger than coffee. But we ended up having a bit of a chat um, at the end of the day and we brought in some other people from other departments as well. And um, we said, look, this has got to stop. I don't know what we can do, but what, you know, what, what, what should we do? Um, and the head of another emergency department said, actually, I've got the Director General's mobile phone in my number in my phone. And he said, if we ever have a problem or a crisis, I should call. And another one of our people said, oh, well, that wouldn't be today then, would it? In a rather cynical sort of a way. But we thought, well, I wonder if he'd mind. So we gave him a call at 7 o'clock at night. So we, I don't know if you've heard, we've had a particularly bad day. And in fact, he had heard um, because it had been in the press and it was on the news and there was pictures of ambulances ramping and all that sort of stuff. And he called a meeting the following day um, of a whole bunch of people from right across health. It was almost as many people as there are in, in this room. There was chief executives and directors of medical services and ED people and there were people from planning and ambulance and you, you have it all there. Um, and that led to the uh, State Emergency Task Force being created, which was um, a misnomer from the start because it looked like it was about emergency care, but it was really about access block and how hospitals work. And that group was chaired by a chief executive or by the Director General directly every Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock from about the week after that happened. And it went for nearly 18 months. Um, and basically because of my outspokenness, I was asked to chair that or be the clinical lead for that. And to be perfectly honest, we had no idea what we were going to do or what, what problems we had to solve, but we just thought we had to do something. And the minister came along monthly to that meeting just to see what progress we were making. And we did all sorts of things. Um, we started at that stage, I had never heard of redesign at that stage, although I had an interest in quality improvement and patient care and safety, quality and risk. Um, but um, I was just starting to get an inkling that you could do sort of things in a systematic way to improve care. Um, I want to cut a long story short, but uh, the Director General in, in 2008, uh, a year later, said, I think we should have a four hour rule like the Brits. And I said, no way. No way, over my dead body are we going to have a four hour rule. Most of my de emergency department was, was staffed by very, very good hard working registrars who were literally four hour rule refugees from the UK. Um, and all I'd heard was negative. And that wasn't the way emergency medicine's done in Australia. We weren't having any of that, thank you. Everyone knew that it had been a disaster. 
Um, but my boss's 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 boss uh, persevered and he said, no, I want, I want you to go and do, do a jurisdictional review. I want you to go and have a look at um, the UK 4-hour program and come back and see what you can implement or learn from it and maybe we'll do a whole program. And a, and a bunch of eight or nine of us went, some of us clinicians, um, only one or two of us emergency physicians, but we had a geriatrician and we had, had some other people, um, nursing and allied health, and we had a few bureaucrats and CEs like me. And we did a two-week tour in November 2008 that was hosted or orchestrated by the King's Fund. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. It's a not-for-profit sort of think tank, health policy think tank based in London. Um, which took us to a couple of key places both in, in London, um, some regional cities in England and also to Scotland where we saw a, a full spectrum of, of tertiary hospitals that were doing very, very well in the four-hour standard. We also went to some regional places that were not doing very well and we went to some regional and small hospitals in Scotland that had done very, very well indeed. Um, we were all conspiracy theorists, or we were all had a conspiracy, I should say, in that the group of us who were going, we all, we all knew each other vaguely by the time we, we went, and we all said to each other before we went, let's write the report now. The report will be that we saw some interesting things, but we're not going to have a four-hour rule. And while we're away, we'll cherry-pick some of the best things, solutions, and come back with them. Anyway, um, my journey, um, I sort of became a director of clinical reform and improvement for a while. I was head of a task force. Um, I then became, I'll talk about that in a minute, the executive state lead um, for the four-hour program throughout Western Australia for a period of three years. Kate Brockman and I met in those early days. Um, Kate and I um, did a lot of redesign work at Royal Perth Hospital specifically. Um, and then I sort of... Um, had a, a hiatus where I wasn't sort of at the, at the end of that um, and then was asked with no notice, completely out of the blue, would I act as the Royal Perth Hospital Executive Director? Um, completely leapfrogging about three different, three tiers of the organisation. Um, and I said, oh, I'll give it a go. Um, I uh, did it for a couple of months and then away, went away for six months. They were trying to then recruit somebody. In the third round of recruitment, I was asked to apply and I got the job. And I did the executive director's job for about two and a half years. And then just recently, um, while we're reconfiguring the seven or eight hospitals of the South Metro Health Service, and while we're commissioning the Fiona Stanley Hospital, um, I've been asked to um, lead the South Metropolitan Health Service um, uh, since May. Quite a challenge. So just to show you what, what Royal Perth Group is like, it's three hospitals, Royal Perth you've heard of, um, about just under 600 multi-day beds. Our ED is seeing at the moment 85,000 presentations a year. Our admission rate is identical. By the way, we're fitting those presentations into the exact architecture that we had six years ago with pretty much the same staffing. Um, and we have a state adult major trauma centre. And we're associated with two other hospitals. But the South Metropolitan Health Service, it has another four or five hospitals in it including the, we're commissioning the Fiona Stanley this October. Um, we have about 12,000, about, about 14,000 heads um, working in our area. And um, my budget um, is actually for this year, including Fiona Stanley with, with, with my counterpart, um, is about 2.5. Um, but this, this financial year expenditure budget's 2.2. I um, believe I can say unequivocally that the implementation of the NEAT in Western Australia has been associated. Um, finding a causal relationship obviously in a scientific perspective is quite difficult but has been associated with quite marked improvement in, in, in hospital 30-day mortality for patients. 